Hello, my name is Alfredo. Welcome to my piano space time. This is my study discussion on Debussy's Cloche à travers le feuille from the second group of images. You can find on YouTube my performance of this piece at the link that I posted in the description notes here under. Before starting presenting my thoughts on this music, uh, let's play a few lines. Before entering into the details of the technical and musical issues to work on, uh, let me say a few general considerations about this work. Uh, I believe this piece is exceptionally rich in uh, musical and artistic terms, and from the specific viewpoint of the performer, uh, this translates in a variety of um, technical uh, styles uh, textures or choreographies uh, that are very diverse along the seven pages of music. And, um, however, in my opinion, there are two dominant aspects to be uh, kept in mind while uh, working on this music score. And I would say that, incidentally, both of them are quite elusive, ambiguous, in strict pianistic terms. And the first one is playing the piano, meant as playing uh, softly, gently at the piano. And the second is playing legato. Uh, when we go into the details, I'll try to be uh, more specific, to articulate uh, what I mean regarding uh, these two aspects that, once again, I defined elusive and ambiguous in terms of uh, pianistical technique. There is also, I think, a third aspect that is in a way uh, related to the first one, to playing piano. This third aspect is to highlight, to underline a specific melodic line uh, along a polyphonic texture, or to highlight highlight uh, specific notes uh, across that texture. Um, so I think uh, these are uh, subtle and, and yet crucial um, elements that we should keep in mind, I believe, since the very first moment of opening the score and starting in working on it to build up our uh, playing the choreography uh, to develop our um, capability to, to express the musical ideas working on the requirements of the, the keyboard and of the notes. Uh, one other uh, general consideration um, is for me to underline the fact that the music score is very rich of details that I am quite sure come directly from Debussy. We find plenty of notes regarding expressivity, uh, plenty of um, uh, agogic indications, so uh, suggesting you how to regulate the speed, uh, the accelerations or the um, deceleration in the music. There are, of course, a great number of dynamic indications, so piano, pianissimo, forte. Clearly, we notice that the large majority of the piece is basically on the level of piano and pianissimo. And uh, this on one side 
is an additional challenge, in particular if you want to memorize the work and you are proposing yourself to perform in a faithful, faithful way uh, with the entirety of the indications that Debussy wanted to, to leave for us on the, uh, on the paper. Uh, on the other end, I think that this richness of indications is a facilitation for us because uh, several times when I kind of uh, went back with my attention to, to look at them, I felt like I was given an additional turn uh, on the key to open the door and enter uh, the magic world of Debussy's uh, harmonic and uh, musical ideas. One, one more thing, uh, for my discussion, uh, for reasons of good order and, and convenience of exposition, I will start from measure one and I will go on until the end of the piece. Well, I believe that this is not at all the best way to study a piece of music, and certainly a piece of music of this difficulty. Uh, instead, I think the best thing would be to start picking up one of those points here and there that appears uh, appear more scary to you in terms of uh, performing difficulties. Certainly these points will require more time for you to work and to master them, and instead the rest of musical sections will more easily uh, grow up in your familiarity to handle them while you are investing more time on the problematic parts. This being said, let's start with uh, the first two measures with the detailed discussion. So here we see already uh, what I highlighted in terms of richness of details. So let's have a look precisely. We are at the beginning, we have an indication about the speed, uh, length, so slow, in my edition, there is also a metronomic indication, 92 for a, um, for a quaver. Then we start with the PP, pianissimo. We see two accent marks, two different accent marks that we find along the piece several times and in general in the WC uh, music scores. Then in my edition, I have una corda pedal uh, required here, I'm not sure if this, come, if this comes from Debussy or not, and I have also a pedal mark that will start from the very first note and will keep going for um, a total of five measures here. We have a slur, staccato marks, and uh, last we have an expressivity note, Lusseman sonore. I guess in English something like sweetly sonorous, something like that. I find uh, many times very effective to work on music scores applying the technique of outlining. This is not my own idea, it's something I read about in uh, a very interesting book for me uh, that is Abby White Size on Piano Playing. And you will find uh, um, Abby uh, explaining and introducing in, in rich detail the rationale, uh, the foundation of this idea of approaching a, a music line that I believe in many cases, like in these cases, are very effective. What's outlining? Outlining is to remove notes to start familiarizing with, uh, with a segment of music and which notes? The secondary ones. Now, how to find the, the secondary notes? Well, in the large majority of cases, it's quite simple. You start playing just the, the notes on the main beat of the, of the line, and this is typically a, a very good guess. So in here, uh, supposing we are at the very beginning, rather than taking care about doing everything that would be Let's 
outline uh, the nodes that represent the, how to say, let's say, pillars of the bass rhythm of the music. So, and uh, this is, I believe, of great help for our body to start, you know, settling in the choreography, literally, that you have to, to, to express, to, to, to perform, to translate uh, in music uh, this technical thing that is handling with, with an instrument. And this now um, gives us the opportunity to, to work on the differentiation of these two different accent marks that we find in this brief line. So the first uh, accent mark, the wedge, so it's a, it's a more energetic, kind of sharper um, and quicker uh, strike on the key, uh, I think uh, can be uh, effectively taken with uh, uh, your arm supporting the, the finger muscle. And then we have at the, in the middle of the measure the flat accent that suggests to me to reduce the action of the big muscle in the arm and instead kind of uh, more deeply grasping that C, trying to highlight that with respect to the other quavers. So once again, and I know that the microphone of my camera here uh, do not have a good dynamic capability, so unfortunately this will come out flattened. But consider in your study that um, we have to, to, to concentrate in differentiating the action, even in physical terms, that corresponds to, the, to these two different accent marks. We can repeat this two or three times and then we'll start adding a few notes here and there. Another consideration on these few notes. So we have this slur and the staccato signs. To me it sounds plausible that uh, these staccato notes rather than being performed with a sort of finger jumps like Instead, are more to be taken by a kind of uh, careful pressure, like you try to gently and deeply take these notes with the finger, and these also create what sounds to me something like the indication "dusseman sonore" uh, wants you to, uh, to to perform. So once again, um, arm action on the first accent, a kind of uh, more assertive touch on the in the middle of the measure. So. And a deep sweet pressure on the secondary notes. Well, in a way, I think that these concepts I introduced are what we need to work on on the 90% of the work, but I don't want to be so hermetic, so I will enjoy 
commenting the rest of measures in detail, but uh, I will take again uh, these basic ideas in several times that are what we need to, to keep in mind to work here. Uh, I said at the beginning in the general thoughts about um, one dominant aspect that is playing piano, playing gently, and I said this being elusive, ambiguous. And I believe this, yes, it's, it's really very true, it's kind of uh, one of the main technical issues that we have to work on in, in our experience of uh, performing with this instrument. Um, in fact, you know, this very same piano in the small room where I am, basically, in a way, uh, is playing loud with uh, whatever intensity of touch I am, I am using. And, of course, if, if I increase the energy and the number of notes, this loudness will uh, increase uh, quite, quite a lot. But the same instrument, uh, if it is placed in a music hall, instead will immediately become a kind of a weaker um, musical instrument, in particular this old piano that has not the energy of certain modern instruments. And this is quite tricky, and in my personal experience uh, over the years, uh, even the, the, the piano teachers unconsciously at times uh, become kind of misleading in uh, commenting what you are doing on the keys in terms of what to do with, with a piano line. Once again, this is a very elusive thing, so I, I don't pretend in a few minutes here to, to, to solve the issue, it is something that probably uh, will go on with the life of, of a pianist, uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> forever, in a way of saying. Um, but another two hints, I think, uh, can help us to navigate through this particular and very important aspect. Uh, for example, I was hearing, not long time ago, in a documentary about the super great pianist Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. Uh, there was in the documentary a brief section where um, they were interviewing uh, uh, a lady that was one of his pupils in younger age. And one very interesting comment she was saying was that uh, Michelangeli was kind of insisting with uh, his pupils um, on the fact that uh, even in the piano, even in the pianissimo, uh, the touch of the pianist has to be, she was saying the term, straight. And I believe this is very important to, to meditate on, uh, because the, the piano it has a range in terms of energy, that is delivered to the, uh, to the strings, uh, a range of energies within which it expresses uh, its, uh, how to say, a potential beauty, a sound beauty. And when you cross the boundaries of the, of the range, either because you are playing too loud or because you are not delivering enough energy on the string, there is a kind of either distortion on the a louder end, or, how to say, uh, paling, pale effect in the sound. And once again, if you are in a small room, perhaps these boundaries on the piano side tends to enlarge a little bit, but then in a larger hall, uh, it is more easily that that side where sounds tend to be pale uh, really loses, how to say, um, beauty and even um, capability of delivering uh, a few notes, those few notes to, uh, to the public that is listening to you. So once again, this idea of the straight touch of even the pianissimo and uh, working to have a sort of assertiveness in the action. And so in this 
piece that is in the large majority carrying the mark of pian and pianissimo, this is a thing always to keep in mind. Otherwise, the risk, I believe, is very easy to uh, inadvertently start to producing pale sounds that will not help to, uh, to develop, to establish the, the sound beauty of this, of this work. So let's move on with bars, uh, with measures three and four. Here I think uh, the, this point gives the opportunity to me to underline the, I believe, rhythmical uh, character of this work uh, that is also in a way, I think, uh, coherent with the evocative title of the work. So uh, when we put all together progressively the notes in these two measures, I would start again with the highlighting to feel clearly that we have a very solid rhythmical um, flow underneath all these little notes. Uh, let's hear that in practice. Once again. Outlining, we start adding a few notes here and there, but we settle down in this rhythmical flow that is, I believe, very characteristic. Here, one thing to work on is the fingering. You see, uh, my suggested indications. Um, so in the edition I have in particular in the second quarter in the right hand, there is a fingering that I didn't found at all comfortable for me, especially here at the beginning of the piece. So I prefer to solve that point uh, in this way. I think an important thing is to monitor your touch in the right hand, at least in this piano, the, the acute keys tends to become a little weaker, so um, in general having the care, the attention, hearing whether your touch is sufficient to express what is written here a little um, highlighted on the top, right? without missing that rhythmic pattern of the bells that we played right before removing the secondary notes. In a way I feel is is effective to say here we have to work quite a bit with our touch. That means with the finger grasping possibilities, natural grasping capabilities, uh, to make sure that one note after the other is conveying that legato line, that means uh, sound energy continuity. Going back to the playing the piano elusive thing, well, uh, in a way, uh, I feel I'm not quite playing really piano those notes, and I'm not playing really piano those accents here. I think 
with the instrument is what I need to do to have the nice sound that it can give to me. And instead, the secondary note that are the semiquavers. In this case, the one that can be played a little bit on the surface of the keys, so without the concern of reaching um, neatly uh, the key bed under that. Uh, this I would do certainly when I practice them, so a few uh, repetitions like of the uh, pattern of the nose, this can be helpful, but then again outlining uh, to concentrate with the touch control in deep terms on the important notes and leave the rest instead a little bit more on the surface, really to leading the hearing attention on what the Bussy wrote uh, to be highlighted, the melody and the accent. this not quite natural fingering that in a way is obliged in my opinion is effective when I study to kind of be generous in the in the movement even in the disconnection kind of enlarge your comfort zone and using that, especially if you play slow, um, not to tighten your physical action there and not to, uh, how to say, um, restrict the expressivity of the line. So once again, few times again going back to the outlining and progressive feeling to do things um, at tempo. six and let's say a few things about that. At bar five we have this left hand with a sort of kids playing. I mean to say you see that the fourth and fifth finger are just jumping over uh, these uh, second intervals like and is doing nothing particularly complicated. Uh, well, once again, outlining I think is a good way to familiarize with this. Even to uh, express that crescendo, so kind of focus on the starting points and the arrival points, and similarly with the left hand, the starting point that is a piano or a pianissimo and gradually increasing intensity. So let's outline keeping in mind that there is a crescendo and a diminuendo. Bar 
6 with uh, a pianissimo. Here I want to underline the bells in the tenor and in, in the contralto. So. can conveniently hold physically the G. And is large enough to take this notes with the one is a possibility or simply do it like. the accuracy of the indication there is a um, decelerating here at the end so and once again outlining help us to kind of shift our attention on the crucial musical details Here at measure seven, what we in a way uh, found at measure three, so it's a variant of that main line. And I want here to underline that second general consideration regarding playing legato. Already at measure three, we come across that, but I, I didn't in my words highlight that. So the right hand is required to play a legato line that is. Clearly, it's impossible at this legato. Let's not be concerned about that, but rather let's be careful in the intensity of the notes, in the fluidity of the choreography. And notice here once again the uh, neat rhythmical character of the music with the left hand that is starting this uh, accompaniment with a rhythmic figure. Here in my edition the pedal is uh, interrupted in the middle of the measure, I think uh, uh, it's necessary. And uh, for the rest is something similar to measure three, but we notice that we have a slightly heavier action, so we have, while studying, calibrate our touch, especially with the right hand, um, so that we underline that line over an overall pianissimo indication, as Bebusi is writing. So, once again, a bit more assertive in the soprano. And instead, staying a bit on the surface, playing with the grasping capability and modulating in not transferring the weight of the arm on the semi quavers so that the soprano actually stay highlighted. And the left end, uh, just um, a very light rhythmical pattern. Notice that here we don't have that accent in the bass that we had at measure 3 and 4. So these are tiny differences that I believe are very important in the musical message. We have reached measure 9 and 10, so we have some new musical material here. Uh, once again, outlining here as in, I think, each of the measures of this work is a great way to uh, build up our choreography and uh, uh, becoming confident with the texture we have to perform. Here 
here we have a couple of tricky points the second and the fourth quaver of measure nine where we jump with the hands to a relatively far position so we i need to practice that a number of times to become solid and confident Here we have an indication nearly nothing for the left hand in this figure. I think a practical way is first to start with some finger that you feel you are very comfortable with to explore the possibility of the action in terms of this nearly nothing. So for instance with my right hand I take the second finger and I explore what I can really do as nearly nothing without losing the sound at all and without entering into something that is more than nearly nothing. So now I get the sound idea, I try to work on that with my weak finger that has to be used here. Measure 11 and 12, they are a variant of measures 9 and 10. Uh, so we have again to practice that jump with a different harmony here between the end of measure 11 and the beginning of the 12th. And here, as in measures 9 and 10, I think I didn't say that practicing even in chord is helpful, I believe. It's not alone sufficient for me, but it's a good, helpful step, and even keep adding the lines quite assertively. outlining we start paying attention to the real uh, important thing the bearing points of the musical message in particular notice the accents that are uh, the bells that come in the picture in the second half of measure 12 so i outline from the measure before and let's start playing that accents in the choreography Once we are familiar with these base pillars of the musical flow, we fill up here and there, and as long as we, de we develop confidence, we increase the number of notes. Mm -hmm. 